God is good, isn't he? All the time, right? All the time. God is good. God is good. That's far more than a refrigerator verse, isn't it? God is good to us. I'm telling you, though, a lot of times it, you have to really look for the goodness. Uh, uh, and I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to be ugly to God in any way. I'm just saying that there are lots of times where... Uh, we're expecting God to swerve and, you know, and he bounces or we're expecting him to bounce and he swerves. And uh, the things that we pray are not often, uh, they don't often line up exactly with how things work out. Uh, and we have to really, we have to really pay attention to what God's doing and we have to stick with God. We have to hang on and that's what the Lord uh, asks us to do is to believe him and trust him. To walk by faith means that uh, you've heard the old acrostic for faith, I'm sure. This is not new to you, but F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust him. Uh, faith means that in spite of whatever may be appearing, uh, I'm believing that God is working for my good and to benefit and to move me forward and uh, to, to do greatness in my life. How many of you feel like that God, and I'm not, this is not really, I'm not asking you to be critical about your life per se, I'm just wondering if, if you have a sense that God has a bigger life for you than you're, lead, than, than you're now leading. Uh, I'm not trying to put down on you, really believe me. I'm not trying to be critical about your life. I'm just, I just know that in, in many lives, I mean, I'm 63 years old. I've lived for the Lord. I was 16 years old when I came to the Lord, when I, when I bowed my knee and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, save my soul, change my life. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Lord forever. And I gave my heart to Christ when I was 16 years old. Didn't come from a Christian family. None of my family knew the Lord. I didn't even know anybody that knew the Lord. I got invited to church by somebody that didn't even know the Lord. It was a, it was a, what, what Baptist, uh, Baptist churches have that many time, many Baptist churches have that are called homecoming. And it's just like a big old family reunion. And, um, and that was, a, it was, a, I, I came from a little Baptist country church in Lauderdale County and um, there was a friend that went to this church and said, hey, man, they're having homecoming. Uh, it's going to be dinner on the grounds and blah, blah. Come go to church with me. I was 13 years old. And, he's, and so I did, and, and I, I found a group of young people there, you know, a small group of young people, and, and uh, I liked them, and they seemed to like me, and I needed that at that time in my life. You know, you're a 13-year-old boy. You need to be you need to have some kind of sense of admiration or respect, you know, and so they seemed to be that way. So I, I, I just kept coming, and for the next three years, for three years, guys, seriously, for three years, I was there every time the doors were open on that church. Wednesday night, now, you know, for many of you that have come from traditional churches from, uh, from long ago, the, things have changed a lot in church life now, not only in some of the things we do, but in how often we do it. <laughs> we, uh, back then, you know, you went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night every week. And, uh, you know, the church was open and the people, and, and it, was a, it was full services and everything. And I was there every time. And then we had teaching before church on Sunday morning and Sunday night for young people, all that kind of stuff. And I was there every time the doors opened. So I'm assuming that they probably thought, well, because he's here all the time, he obviously knows the Lord. He's obviously a Christian. And, um, you know, and I participated in everything. I even sang in the youth choir. That was back before all the young people decided that it wasn't cool to sing in a choir, you know. We used to have a youth choir, and we went all over the place singing to other churches and all that kind of, oh, grand days, grand days. But, but I didn't know the Lord. I mean, it, it took me three years, obviously, uh, sitting in a service, being in classes and so forth, um, to put piece together the fact that uh, coming to church didn't make me a Christian. And, uh, and, and that reading the Bible didn't make me a Christian, and singing the hymns didn't make me a Christian, and singing in the choir didn't make me a Christian, that it was a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that I had to enter into on purpose. I had to ask Christ to come into my life, to change me, to be my Lord. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says in Revelation. And if you'll open the door, I'll come in. And he's not going to break the door down, and he's not going to barge into your life, but He's going to come when you invite him to, to come into your life and change your life, forgive your sins, save your soul, be your Lord, be your master. You'll do what he says for the rest of your life. You make a commitment like that. Well, I did that when I was 16, so add up 16 and 63, oh, 40-something years, whatever. 
Uh, somebody quick in math, you can add that up. Bunch of 47 years. I knew Jim was going to get it. That is the quickest man. He is the smartest man. I'm sorry. 47 years I've been with the Lord. And I can say after 47 years, now I've been in the, I started preaching the gospel when I was 18 years old. When I was 18 years old, I just graduated from high school. And in the summer between high school and my freshman year in college, there was a little small church in Marie, a little, little, little uh, mission church, a little country mission church. I, the, they probably didn't have 30 people in the whole church, but they had a, a fuss and a split, and they split up. They couldn't be with each other anymore, and so there were about five people left in this little country church and little mission church, and my pastor said, uh, you know, you've said that you would do what the Lord wanted you to do, and you feel like God might be calling you to something in your life, and, and you don't know what it is, but you're praying that the Lord would use you and so forth, so why don't you go out there? There are about five people left. Uh, you need the practice, and they need somebody to help them, you know? And so help them to decide, all right, are we going to keep going as a church, or are we going to sell the church and close down and move on, you know? And so I'm 18 years old. I go out there. I don't know anything about the word other than what I've heard my pastor preach in the few short years that I've been in church. I haven't done anything more than just kind of go to some Bible studies and some youth classes and some church training classes and all those kind of things. And so I'm just, you know, <laughs> I don't know anything. I, I'm so green, I not only don't know anything, I don't even suspect anything. I mean, it, it's just... And, 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 and the people were so sweet to me because they were all obviously, you know, older people and, and they, they were like my grandparents and I was like their young preacher grandson or something. And, and so I could do no wrong, you know, I mean, they encouraged me and they, whatever I did, they, they liked it and I, it was pitiful, I know it was and, and all of that, but they still loved me and they nurtured me and so forth. So anyway, I started there and so for all of these years, I've been in the ministry. So that means I've been preaching for 45 years. Uh, which is a, a good a good portion of my life. And I, I can just say, I, I said all that to say to you that even now at 63 and after 40, 45 years of preaching and 47 years of walking with the Lord, I still feel like God has something that he wants to do in my life. That, I, that, I, that, that God still has a big storyline for me, is, I guess is the best way to put it. In all of our lives, we have choices to make, and these choices determine our destinies and our futures and, our, and what God does in our life. And we're all searching for some significance to be used by God, to, be, uh, to, to please God, to, to have God work in our life and for our lives to become uh, everything that God created us to be. The number one question that is asked on any survey at any time in the history of surveys, if you had one question you could ask God, what would it be? And the number one question is always, why am I here? Why am I here? And that question is basically saying, what purpose does God have for me? And am I living that purpose that God has for me? And so there's a purpose of God in our lives that we come to him, that, that we receive him and accept him, and, and he becomes the Lord of our life. But once he becomes the Lord of our life, that's not, God's not finished with our life yet. God has much work to do in us, and he leads us, and he moves us on in life, and he has a purpose, and he has a goal, and, he, and, and, a goal. and, and, and I know in many of our lives, we sense this, that somehow... Uh, I'm not living the life that God has intended me to live. I'm not living the big storyline of life. I'm living the small line. I'm living the path of least resistance. I'm leading the line that, that, that is easy for me to live. I'm, I'm, living the, I'm living the line that although I know the Lord and I'm going to heaven when I die, and I'm not worried that you know, I'm going to get left behind one day when Jesus comes or when I die, I'm not somehow going to heaven when I die. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about living the life on this earth that God has intended us to live. And many times in our lives when we begin to understand and we begin to sense that God has more for us, uh, we, begin to, we begin to search and to seek for some way to experience this for some way to be led in this, to grow into this, to, 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 to move into these areas of life and, and be significant in, in our Christian life. Well, because 
most of the lives that we live are so typical, uh, in order to, to live a bigger life, there has to be a transition. And transitions are always tough. Transitions are uncomfortable because we go move into things that we've never moved into before. We don't really know where we're going. We don't know how to get there. Once we begin moving in those areas, we don't know, hey, are we there? Is this, is, am I moving in the right direction? Is this it? God, what, what, what am I doing? I, it's an uncomfortable time and it's an uncertain time because there are no rules for this. There, there, you know, there are no boundaries, so to speak, in this, and, 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 and we're searching for this, and no one can tell us how to do this, because if they're searching like we are, they're experiencing the same uncertainty and the same, and the same uncomfortable part of life that we're experiencing, and so they can't tell us because they don't know if they're doing okay or not. Well, I want to say to you that in order to help you with, these kind, with this kind of search in life, the Lord has a story uh, hidden in the Old Testament that is all about moving to the bigger storyline of life. It's all about becoming what God created you to be. It's all about becoming significant and living the big storyline in life. And it happens in the book of Exodus. I, I know that maybe as you were coming to church this morning, some of you were saying in your heart, man, how I would love to hear a message from the book of Exodus. That would just be awesome. <laughs> and I just want to say, see how God answered your prayer? That is so grand. I, wanna, I, I, I know that many of you know uh, much of the story of Exodus because it's about, it's about the children of Israel and it's about the fact that they are in bondage. They have been in slavery to the Egyptians for 400 years. For 400 years, God's people, God's covenant people, have been in bondage to, a, to, to some heavy taskmasters. And they've been crying and begging and pleading. They've been, for 400 years, they've been laying before God, saying, God, get us out of this wicked place. God, get us out of this horrible, for God forsaken place. Uh, deliver us, Lord. We'll do anything. We're, you know, and they just would beg and pray and beg and pray and cry and bellow and pray. And after 400 years, God speaks to a man who's 80 years old, about the time he was thinking he should retire, God said, no, uh, you're going to aspire. When he was ready for social security, God said, no, you're ready for some social insecurity here, you know. Uh, Moses is on the backside of the desert, keeping, tending a flock of sheep for his father-in-law Jethro. And he, and he sees a bush that's burning out in the distance, and this bush is on fire, but it doesn't consume which is not unusual to see a bush, bush on fire in the desert, spontaneous combustion and the such. That wasn't the unusual thing. The unusual thing was that this bush wasn't burning up. It was just burning and burning and burning. And Moses said, I need to go see what this is. And he goes over, and when he gets close to the bush, God says, take off your shoes, Moses, because you're standing on holy ground. And out of the bush, God begins to speak to him. And God says, here's what you're going to do. I've been hearing the cries of my people for 400 years, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deliver them. And Moses says, hot dog, God. That is the most miraculous thing I ever heard of in my life. I'm one of those Israelites, and I got out of there real quick because I, I murdered somebody, and I had to run for my life. But, uh, but I got out of there, and I've been praying, and I've been saying, God, you need to do something. These people are your people, and you need to get them out of there. And I agree with you, God. It's the most awesome thing I ever heard. Hot dog, you're going to deliver them. And then he says, yeah, and I'm going to use you to do it. And then Moses starts stuttering, uh, 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 you know, I, I can't talk so good. <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, God, I'm 80 years old. I can't do it. Uh, and, and I can't talk good. And he said, well, take Aaron with you. That's your brother. You know, take him with you. He talks good. And uh, in any way, after a long discussion, uh, Moses and Aaron go down to see Pharaoh. And when they go down to see Pharaoh, now the, what they're going to say to Pharaoh is, God said, when you go down there, you tell Pharaoh, you say, let my people go. And Moses said, when I say that to him, he's going to say, who says so? 
And you tell, and God said, you tell him that I am said so. And you take that rod over there, that staff that you got, and you carry it with you because I'm going to do some miracles with it. And, um, and you just go down there and you tell him, I said, let my people go. Now, they've been slaves for 400 years. Life's been tough. They've been crying and begging and pleading. God, we know you have more. We know that you have a place for us because God had promised them a place, a, a, a land. It's called the promised land. <laughs> <laughs> Quite catchy, right? Yeah, yeah. It's called the promised land because God promised them that land. So now they're in bondage and there is a land of promise. And between the bondage and the promised land, there is a period of transition where God removes them from bondage and carries them into that land that he promised them. Uh, Transcending the Christian life, God has brought you from a point where you didn't know the Lord and he saved your soul if you are a Christian, and I pray that you are, and most of you uh, testify that you are, that you already know the Lord, that the Lord lives in your life. Well, there's a land here. There's a promised land. There's a life of, uh, of, of significance. There's a big storyline. There's a, there's a place of usability and use, and, and there's a place where where you can be satisfied and comforted and you can sense this, uh, that, that, that God is working in your life and that you're lined up with him and you're hearing him and you're walking with him and God is pleased with you and you are accomplishing the purpose that God has set forth for you when he created you on this earth. But between the bondage and the promised land, there is a transition that all of us must face. And in many times, the transitions, once we begin to pray and we say, Lord, get us out of this horrible place. I know I'm not where I should be. I know I'm not accomplishing what I should accomplish. And I, and I, I know there's more for me. And I know there's a big storyline. And I know there's a, there's a happier future. There's a brighter family. There's a greater life. There's, a, there's more for me. You, 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 you can do more. You can have more. I can be more. My family can be more. And you just have that sense that God has more for you in the future. And as God begins to lead you from where you are to, to that land of promise, Many of us feel like, okay, I'm going to pray about this, and it's going to be a hop, skip, and a jump, and a merry Sunday school picnic, and I'm going to be there. But may I say to you that God doesn't work that way, <laughs> and life doesn't work that way. We love miracles, right? We all pray for miracles, and we expect miracles. And many miracles happen in our life. But there are many things in life that we don't experience in a 30-second prayer service at an altar on Sunday morning. There are many things that God has to work and move through our life that, that when it's happening, it just doesn't seem like what we prayed for. But God brings us through these things. And I just want to make you aware, just, just very quickly this morning, just on a kind of a surface level little look at this, at some of the things that we can expect in this transition of life. Because if you're going to go somewhere, it's a good thing to know where you're going and most likely what the trip is going to be like while you go there. And so God shares with us in this story of Moses and the children of Israel and their deliverance uh, some tremendous insight about what we face so that we can be prepared and, and be successful in this journey. Because I want to be successful in this journey. I don't want to be disappointed. I don't want to come short. I don't want to fail in my movement toward the Lord. I want the Lord to use me. I want, I want to be what God created me to be. I want to be everything God created me to be. And if I'm, if I'm preaching 25 years from now, you know, I'll be like, what, uh, 85, 88 years old. Uh, I, I still want to be used by the Lord, and I want the Lord to be pleased with my life. And so what can I expect, and what do I need to prepare for? And let me just show you, this is a kind of an unusual thing. Beginning in Exodus chapter 5, we have the first encounter that God has with Moses. I'm just going to read this, this verse and, then, and share with you just a thought about this, and then we'll move on. But this is, the first ver this is the first time that Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh with what God said after the burning bush. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, I want to just mention to you about this feast in the wilderness to just say that the feast there is a, is a holy day. It's a holy time. 
This word feast means uh, a service, a, a ceremony, a practice. Uh, you know, Israel had what God gave to them called holy days. They were days that God said, all right, on this day you'll do this, and this day you'll do this. And he gave them all kinds of uh, uh, functions to do on those days that represented spiritual activity, uh, atonement and first fruits and, and uh, tabernacles and all of these holy days. There were seven of them. Israel is the only nation in the world that God gave them their holidays. That's the word holiday is a shortage of the word holy day. And, and so their holidays came from the Lord and, and, and they were called feasts. They were spiritual times. And I just want to note it for you to notice this about this verse is that God said the reason he wanted his people to be, to go, to be let go is so that they can go out into the desert. The word wilderness, we think of woods and I mean, you know, we're from the South and we're from tree country and all that. And when we think of wilderness, we think of like large forests and so forth. But the word wilderness just means uninhabited by humans or untouched by humans. And so a desert is a wilderness. And, and, and here they're going out into the desert. And just to call to your attention, what God says, I want my people to do is I want my people to go out into the desert and worship me. And I just want to point out the fact that the most difficult place in the world to worship God would be in the desert. You know, the desert is barren. The desert is hostile. The desert is, uh, is a tough region. And so basically what God is saying is God saying, look, here's what, my, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take you from this land where you have houses and you have uh, food and you have all of these things, these comforts, even though you're slaves, you do have all of these things. And I'm going to take you out there where you have nothing and, I'm, and, and you're going to worship me out there where you have nothing. And so that's a spiritual life. It's a spiritual activity that the Lord calls. The most difficult place in the world to worship God is when we have nothing yeah, yeah. or when we're in difficult times and hard times. Man, all of us can yeah. dance and jump, jump and buck and shout and hoot and holler and everything else when everything's going great in our life. When you know, we're fat, happy, and sassy and all the bills are paid and there's a chicken in every pot, so to speak, and a car in every garage and nobody's repossessing anything and I'm paying my bills and life seems to be grand. Man, it's easy to come down and shout and praise the Lord and, and sing, uh, Amy, of the goodness of God. You know, yeah. yeah, it's easy to praise God when everything's praiseworthy, but what about in the deserts of life? And God said, I want you to go out in the desert and I want you to worship me out there where you have nothing. That's my purpose. Well, now you, you, you would need to know this because I don't have the rest of the scripture in chapter five, but if I did, you would find out what happened was when Pharaoh heard this, Pharaoh made it harder on the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, Pharaoh got mad about this. Pharaoh said, well, I tell you what, what's happening with the children of Israel is they just have too much time on their hand. And I'm not going to give them, you know, you say you want to take them out in the desert. That's like a three-day holiday, Moses. And uh, I'm not going to give them any holidays because I can see right now that if I give them any time to think, what they're going to do is think up some way that they can rebel against me. So I'm going to make it tougher on them. And so Pharaoh took the straw away from the children of Israel. They had to make bricks every day to build structures for the Egyptians. And they not only had to make the brick, they had to lay the brick, they had to build with the brick, but to make brick, they had to use straw. And the Egyptians gathered and collected all the straw they needed so that when they made the brick, they just had to go and get the straw and bring it and put it and use it in the brick. And they made the brick and it hardened and it, it, it became a brick they could use for building. Well, without straw, that means they had to go out and get their own straw. That means they had to rummage the streets and run through the alleys, picking up straw, picking up straw. And, and then they had to go back and make the brick. And he said, and I'm not taking any of the totals off of you for how many brick I'm expecting from you every day. So all it did was double their work and double their, their torture in life. And so when, you know, a lot of times when, when we think, all right, God's going to move us to a, uh, his purpose or his destiny or we're going to become more pleasing to God or we're going to move on with God, we think that life's going to get easier. And I'm just telling you that according to what the scripture teaches, life doesn't get easier when we say we're moving on with God. As a matter of fact, the enemy just redoubles his effort to stop you from moving forward in life. 
And so Pharaoh says, I'm going to make it harder, and life is going to be worse than it's ever been before in life. Well, of course, you know what happens if you've read your Bible and you've been in church very often because somebody's probably preached on on what happens when Israel gets delivered. Of course, Pharaoh says, I'm not letting them go. And God says, oh, yes, you are. And he says, and so they start these, these, uh, these uh, plagues that start falling on Egypt. And the first one, the river turns to Nile and so forth. And then frogs come and then gnats come and then lice come and mites and mites. And, 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 and then long about the third or fourth one of these, there are 10 of them all together, by the way. It's like a 10-round prize fight is what it's about. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's the Lord and it's Pharaoh going round and round. Of course, you recognize that Pharaoh represents the ruler of the evil land, which obviously is the devil himself. And in the story, it's easy to see how this happens. And so there's a fight between God and the devil over the deliverance and the, and the use of his people. And so Pharaoh fights with all of his might. About the fourth, about the fourth plague that comes along, Pharaoh begins to kind of start saying, well, maybe I need to think about this. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I really do need to think about, about what's going on. And here in chapter 8, he gets a little bit of he gets a little bit of uh, uh, of of uh, softness in him, and he calls for Moses and Aaron, and he said, "All right, I'm going to let you go and sacrifice, but I'm going to let you go and sacrifice in the land. I mean, look, I'm not going to let you go out in the desert, but I'm going to let you I'm going to let you stay in the land here." And, and, and what I want you to see is that every time Pharaoh gives them a suggestion, it's always a compromise. In other words, God said, I want you to go out in the desert and worship me. And Pharaoh says, okay, okay, wait a minute. I'm going to let you go, but, but, I don't, but you're not going to get to go out in the desert. I want you to stay in the land. And, and I call this a, a, a compromise concerning salvation because uh, this is just this is how Satan operates in keeping our lives in check. Uh, this sounds good, you know. I'm going to let you go and sacrifice in the land, and and it sounds like he's you know he, it's going to be okay. And say and, and and Pharaoh's giving in. You want to sacrifice, okay? You want to be religious, that's okay. Um, you want to you want to give yourself to God. You want to worship Him. You want to do what He's asking you to do. That's okay. But you don't have to go out in the desert to do this. You, you can stay here in the land. In other words, the compromise is that you would stop short of doing what God, that you would not come all the way out, that you would be satisfied with staying in the land and staying, in, staying where you are. Uh, uh, this compromise has been a, an excellent tool for the enemy to keep us close uh, because true Christianity is not something that you just tack on to the end of your life. It's a total change in your life. It's not something that you can stay in the land where you're in and practice. You have to make a total break and break totally away. So the first compromise that Satan says is, look, okay, uh, okay, you want to serve God, you want to worship God, that's okay, but just, don't, just stay here and do it, okay? I mean, you don't have to go way out. You just stay right here and do it. You know, stay in your old lifestyle, stay in your old land, stay in your old haunt, stay with your same people, stay with the same, and, and, just, and just, you know, uh, worship God and do what you want to do. So it's a, it's a compromise. Satan offers a compromise. Here's the second one. And Moses says, well, it's not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, uh, then they'll, will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commands us. Now, so Pharaoh said, well, I'll let you go. And that's a good thing because he couldn't stop them. You know, God had already, God had already sent about four or five plagues now and he can't stop them. But I'm, Pharaoh said, all right, I'm going to let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far, uh, uh, intercede for me or, or consider what I'm saying. And, uh, and this is the problem with a lot of our lives is that once we do come to Christ, we just don't go very far. Uh, we don't take our lives seriously. We don't do what it takes to grow very much. 
Uh, it's easy to come to the Lord, to sit in a church and say, all right, uh, at the invitation time, I've received the Lord, I've got Christ in my heart, and I'm good. And, and, and then not consider the fact that in order to go forward with the Lord, there has to be some growth in our life. And we have to commit ourselves to do some things that would allow us to grow. We have to study our scripture. We have to pray. We have to be involved in, in lives. And so uh, in order for our life to be significant, we have to not only come to the Lord, we have to go all the way with the Lord. So compromise concerning separation. Let me give you verse 8. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and they said to them, Go serve the Lord your God, but who, who are the ones that are going? So Pharaoh says, All right, uh, I tried to get you to uh, stay in the land, to not go out and sacrifice. And so I, I tried to get you to stay close to me. And then we're not going three days out, so you can't get separated. But now that I can't stop you from coming to the Lord and I can't stop you from going out to the Lord, let me just ask you, who are you planning to take with you? Who's going with you? Who are the ones that are going? And Moses said... We will go with our young and with our old and with our sons and with our daughters and with our flocks and our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Moses said, all right, everybody's going with us. We're taking our young ones. We're taking our old ones. We're taking our daughters, our sons. Then Pharaoh said, uh, said to them, the Lord uh, had better be with you when I let you go because, and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. Now, this is a compromise concerning your family. In other words, Pharaoh says, all right, uh, you're going out. I can't stop you. Who are you taking with you? Moses says, I'm taking my children. I'm taking my wife. I'm taking my daughter. I'm taking my son. I'm taking the old ones. Taking... We're taking everybody with us. And Pharaoh said, well, you better make sure that God is with you because it's tough out there in that world and it's dangerous out there where you're going. And so uh, you better make sure that God is with you if you're going to take all of these with you. Now, let me just say this to you about God and about your family. God is interested in family salvation. If you read the scripture, you see this all the time. As a matter of fact, one is in the Old Testament, Joshua. Joshua, when they go into the promised land, uh, they were discussing uh, about how tough it was going to be and, and what they needed to do. And, and there was a big argument about what, was going, what they were going to do, whether they were going to go with God or not. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. In the New Testament, when Paul is in the prison and the prison shakes and the walls fall down and the Philippian jailer looks at him and he's about to commit suicide because he thinks all the prisoners have escaped, Apostle Paul says, hey, wait, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And the jailer took Paul home with him and introduced him to his family. And the Philippian jailer and his whole family came to the Lord and, 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 and trusted Christ and got saved. Zacchaeus was up in a tree, you remember, and Jesus was walking down the street. And Jesus stopped under the tree limb and looked at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm going home to have supper with you today. And Zacchaeus took him home. And, and when Zacchaeus got home with him, Zacchaeus' family was there and everybody Zacchaeus knew was there and everybody he could invite there. And the Lord won them all to faith in Christ right there. The Lord is interested not only in you coming to the Lord, but he's interested in, in your whole family coming to the Lord. And what I've noticed is once the Lord begins to work in a family, he, worked, he begins to work in all of the family. Mom gets saved, dad gets saved, children get saved. I mean, God, the Spirit of God begins to work in the whole family because God not only wants you to come out of Egypt, God wants your whole family to come out of Egypt. Your children, your, 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 your extended family, you, your wife, your children, uh, your, your, your older folk, uh, the whole family to come to the Lord. Well, one of the compromises that Satan gives us, he says, all right, you're going to go on to be with, you're going to go on and you're going to be become significant with the Lord. All right, uh, you're going out, you're going all the way out. And who are you taking? Well, I'm taking everybody. And thank God Moses said that one didn't fall for the compromise of leaving some of them behind. You know what Billy Graham said? Billy Graham said, one of the greatest fields of evangelism in America are the family of Christians. Because they come out and they leave their children. It's almost like, well, I'm going to go to the Lord, but then 
I'll leave my children behind. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, uh, go serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back and let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, uh, you must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind for we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. This is a compromise concerning your stuff. This is one of the most difficult areas of life once you come out yourself and once you say, all right, I'm bringing my family out and once you say we're going all the way out and we're, we're not going to stop on the edge, we're going to go all the way out, the devil says, well, um, uh, why don't you leave your stuff back here, you know? I mean, it's dangerous out there in the desert. And you might lose all your stuff. And so why don't you just consider and leave your flocks, your herds, your cattle, and in other words, leave your business back here with me. Now, this is one of the most unusual things in the world because this is probably one of the most difficult things for us to face once we come to Christ and begin to move with the Lord. And that is to recognize that God not only wants us to come out, he wants us to bring all of our stuff out. Uh, you've heard the line so often, uh, business is business and church is church, right? As if somehow there's a separation between how God wants us to live our life and how God wants us to work our business life. Now, in other words, I'm going to come out, but I'm leaving my business behind because I need to work, in, uh, I need to work my business in a different way. It's interesting to me that we will trust our hearts to the Lord. We will trust our souls to the Lord. We will trust our children to the Lord. Uh, we will trust everything except our, our goods, our, our, our resources to the Lord. And Moses, thank goodness, Moses says, you know what we're coming out with? We're not leaving one hoof behind. We're not leaving one, one cow horn behind. I mean, we're, bringing, we're not only coming out, but we're coming all the way out, and we're bringing everything that God has given us out with us. And so Moses says, we're coming out of Egypt, and as they march out of Egypt, um, they're fully convinced that God is with them and that God's going to bless them. Now, I want to move to Exodus chapter 14 because this is when they actually move out. I want you to see three things real quick about what you face once you get out of Egypt. This is when they're about to move out, the day that they're about to move out, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I get asked about that uh, when I'm at this passage sometimes. How, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. What did the Lord do to harden the heart of Pharaoh? Well, According to the New Testament passages, there are three things that you can do that will, harden, that, will, that will harden your heart. One is, if we deny the Word of God, the Word of God denies us. In other words, when I hear the Word of God and I deny what God says in His Word, my heart does not stay the same. It gets harder. And so whenever I deny what God says in His Word, then, the word, then, then my heart gets harder. When I choose darkness rather than light... It hardens my heart. In other words, there are many times when we know what God says and we know what God has written and what we should do, but we, choose, we make a choice and, and we choose not to receive what God has said. And when we choose to disregard what God has said and choose darkness rather than light, it hardens our heart. And then the third thing is when we walk away from the presence of God, it hardens our heart. In other words, the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and speaks to our life and then we just totally disregard the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit speaks, we just walk away from hearing the Holy Spirit and we reject the Holy Spirit. That hardens our heart. So what did God do to harden the heart of Pharaoh? He just withdrew himself and allowed Pharaoh to become what Pharaoh was intended to be, what Pharaoh wanted to be, what Pharaoh was choosing to be. That, uh, that Pharaoh wanted to, Pharaoh didn't want to hear God. Pharaoh didn't want to have anything to do with God. Pharaoh didn't listen to the word of God. Pharaoh didn't uh, obey the spirit of God. And so as God pulled back, Pharaoh just became what Pharaoh was intend, intended or what, what he chose to be in life. I've heard people say this before when I'm talking to them about the Lord, and maybe you have too, maybe even somebody in your own family. You, have you ever heard anybody, you're talking to them about the Lord in some way, and they say, you know what I do? I wish God would just leave me alone. Well, may I say to you that that's exactly what you don't want. You don't want God to leave you alone. Because if God leaves you alone, then your heart becomes hard, and there's no way for you to change in life. So as the children of Israel began to leave Egypt, Pharaoh's heart hardened. He told them he, they could leave, 
But as they began to leave, his heart became hard, and he said, I don't want them to leave, and I don't think I'm going to let them leave. And so he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. They were happy, excited, believe in God, glory in God, uh, praising God. They were high-fiving, cheering as they went out. And they were, and they were fully uh, believing that God was going to deliver them and that life was going to be grand for them. Why did they go out with a high hand? Why were they happy and enthused about this and excited about this? Well, it doesn't tell you in chapter 14, but it does back in chapter 13. It says that the children of Israel were being led by the glory of God. So what was happening was, when the, as long as the children of Israel kept their eyes on the glory of God, and let me share a word with you that uh, I, I'm sure some of you have heard because I've mentioned it before, but it's the word Shekinah. Now, Shekinah is a Hebrew word, and Shekinah just means uh, visible, the visible glory of God. So when God's glory manifests itself so that you can see it and it's visible, it's called the Shekinah glory of God. In leading the children of Israel out of bondage, the, the Shekinah glory of God manifested itself in two ways. One was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. The pillar of cloud, like a giant supernatural canopy, covered Israel as they marched through the desert. You might have wondered, how in the world could a couple of million people march 40 years in the wilderness and not be burned up by the desert sun? Well, God covered them with a supernatural cloud, the Shekinah glory of God, that covered them and protected them from all the harm of the sun and, and, and kept them cool in the desert in the daytime. Well, at night, and I know if you know anything about deserts, you know at night deserts get extremely cool. And so at, a, at night, there was a giant pillar of fire that encamped itself at one end of the camp, and the children of Israel camped all around it. And as the desert wind blew across the, the pillar of fire, it was like a giant supernatural heater that kept them warm at night. And so the children of Israel followed the cloud by day and the fire by night, and they kept their eyes on the Shekinah glory of God. So how do you follow the Lord in peace and, in, and with a high hand? You keep your eyes on the glory of God. And I know that that sounds like a refrigerator verse, but it's more than just a refrigerator saying, when I keep my eyes on the glory of God, then I am comforted by the glory of God. When I take my eyes off of the glory of God, then I am, I'm susceptible for confusion and attack. And give you an example of, of how that works. Let's just, I'm going to divide you in half just for a second. This side of the congregation is one group of the children of Israel, and you guys are another group of the children of Israel. You guys love God, want to keep your eyes on God. You're following the Shekinah glory of God, and you're walking with God, and you're in the front, and you're moving with God, and wherever the cloud goes or wherever the fire goes, you're moving with him. You guys are not like this. You guys are playing in the back of the crowd. You're back there uh, looking at the tumbleweeds and playing with the cactus in the desert and uh, meander around and back. And as Pharaoh's heart hardened, he begins to pursue the children of Israel, and he comes after them. And the scripture says that he is in, he, that there are 600 chariots are coming across the desert. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think that 600 chariots and horsemen and the horse, uh, horses and horsemen with them, that they're going to stir up a lot of dust on the desert? Well, sure they are. Sure they are. So you guys that are back here meandering around and chasing the horned toads and playing with the cactus and not really focusing on the glory of God, you're back there meandering around and all of a sudden you look back and you turn and you look toward the back and you see this giant cloud of dust and, and coming up behind you. And, 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 and of course, when you see this, uh, you know, you know something's coming up behind and now... Uh, you begin to try to pass the word up to the front. These guys up in the front, they're just going with the glory of God and their lives are moving forward. But the fear comes from those that are, that are, coming, that are looking behind. So the, in, so the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea behind, uh, beside hard name number one and hard name number two. And, um, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And so they were very much afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Uh, why have you so dealt with us to bring us out in e into Egypt? Now, just briefly, uh, they see the dust coming up. They begin to uh, send the word up the line. The Egyptians are coming. The Egyptians. And when the children of Israel took their eyes and, and turned their eyes away from 
the deliverer and put them on uh, the pursuer, when they took it away from the glory of God and put it on the trouble that was coming up behind them, the scripture says they became sore afraid and they began to be full of fear. And they said to Moses, they, they really complained to God, but notice it said, and they said to Moses, which always happens when you got a bone to pick with God, you always look for a preacher. But uh, <laughs> they said it to Moses. They said, uh, uh, why did you bring us out in the wilderness to, to die out here in the wilderness? Uh, weren't there enough graves back in Egypt, which is a total insult to God. Uh, Egypt, if there's any other country in the world that's known for graves and death, it'd be Egypt, you know, with pyramids and mummies and tombs and all that. But, and then they say in verse 12, is this not the word we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we, than that we should die in the wilderness. And, and so uh, you can write beside that in your notes if you have them, right beside that little verse 12, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> liar, liar. They said, you know, what we said, what we've been saying all these years is just leave us alone because it's better for us to serve the Egyptians. Now, is that what they said? No, they were praying and begging and pleading God. God, get us out of this God forsaken place. Do anything. We'll serve you. We'll do anything. And whenever the, tr whenever the, the going gets tight, uh, they say, well, you know, we told you to leave us alone. The people's choice in this whole event was, am I going to go backward? In each event, we have three choices. Am I going backward? In other words, am I going to go back to where it used to be? And in the midst of all these long, tough times of crisis, it's easy to pull back and say, um, I'm tired, this is, this is too much for me, so I want to go back. The children of Israel said, in the midst of this, in this, in the midst of this move toward significance with God and toward the promised land, they said, we have, we have one of three choices, and Israel said, I want to go back because it's just not worth it to me and times are too tough. And when times get tough and times get hard, the very first emotion that we have is, that somehow we want to go back. It's better the way it used to be. We had it, we had it better back in Egypt than we have it now. Let me see. Is that it? Tanya, load a minute. Okay, there it goes. Just put that slide in the middle. I'm sorry. Uh, Moses comes to him and Moses says, and you'll think this, from, you'll think this was from the Lord if you didn't... Uh, if you didn't know what God was about to say next. But let me just show you what Moses said. The children of Israel said, we want to go back because things were better. It's too hard to go forward. It's too hard to move forward. We want to go back. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he'll accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll see no more forever. That's sort of true, by the way. Uh, before I read this, the Egyptians that they saw that day were all, of course, drowned in the Red Sea. But the Egyptians that pursued them, uh, pursued them for the rest of their life. Every time Israel stopped in the desert, out from behind a cactus popped an Egyptian. Every rock in the desert, there was an Egyptian pursuing them. The Egyptians never did stop pursuing the children of Israel. Because the devil never stops pursuing you. Once you make a stand and once you come to the Lord, the enemy pursues you and he continues to pursue you. And so Moses says, all right, what we need to do is don't go backwards. We need to stand still. We need to stop and stand still and the Lord will fight for us and you shall hold your peace and the Egyptians that you see, you won't see them anymore. So Moses wants them to stand still. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. So there are three choices that you have as, as, you, go, as you go through the wilderness and you're going toward significance. The devil gives you all kinds of compromise to stop where you are, to not go very far, to leave your children, leave your family. You have three choices. Am I going to go backward? Am I going to stand still? Or am I going to go forward? And God says, Moses, that's, I heard what you said, and the advice is to stand still, and I know that's better than going back, but my, my choice for you is to go forward in life. 
And so as God leads us forward, the, we, our choice is that we would go forward with God and that we would let God lead us, lead us forward in life. Because God's victories lie ahead for us and God's significance lie ahead for us. And as God leads us, God will move in our life. The thing that, that, that we're not used to or the thing that we don't see in life is how difficult it is once we begin moving for God. Once we begin moving toward what God would have for us, the enemy fights against us. The enemy gives compromises. The enemy pursues us. Satan always moves to recapture lost territory in life. And so we have to trust God and listen to God and move with God and say, God, lead us forward in life. I want you will, if you will, just bow your head with me one second.